You know how the placebo effect works, right? Sure you do, because like the majority of people, you know that you're above average intelligence, and you've heard it before tossed around in conversation and on social media, so you know exactly what it means without even needing to look it up and make sure your assumptions are right. That's how smart you are. Obviously, the placebo effect works like this. You take a potion that you think will make you win at Quidditch, but your friend Harry actually switched the potions and gave you a goblet of water. But that tricks your brain to feel like you're better at Quidditch, and even though you only took a placebo, you're filled with so much confidence that you actually do win at Quidditch. But what if a grumpy old Jedi told you Every word of what you just said was wrong. And no, that doesn't just mean that playing Quidditch makes you look like a dope if you're over the age of six. We're talking about that other thing we were talking about. Uh, uh, the placebo effect. Something fake becomes something real because of someone's perception of it. Right, that thing that I thought it was too until I found out I was wrong. You were wrong? What a dumb. Yes, I was wrong, which is cool because I got to learn something new and in my defense, I'm not the only one. Even smart sciencey people mess this one up. The placebo effect. It's a sugar pill with no active ingredients that actually solves the problem for patients 30% of the time. And that's 100% wrong. That link leads to this article, which does not say what he just said it says. It's not just about taking a pill and your performance and your pain getting better. It's about our beliefs and expectations. It's about the cultural meaning of a treatment. No, cultural meaning is not the definition of placebo effect. Next. Top-down processing also explains the placebo effect. If a doctor gives you a pill and says it'll make you feel better, you're probably going to say that it does, even if the pill was actually just made of sugar. Well, that dude tried, but just putting words on the screen doesn't mean you actually got the definition right. But that's not what the placebo effect is. Thank you! Please, Dr. Aaliyah Crum, set the record straight for us. What the placebo effect really is, is a demonstration of the ability of our mindset, in this case, the expectation to heal, to recruit healing properties in the body. Well, that was a uh, uh, swing and a miss. Honestly, I don't feel so bad anymore for getting this wrong most of my life. What a muggle. Okay, enough build up. The truth is that the placebo effect is not a thing. At least, it's not a thing. And it's definitely not the thing any of those people described. If someone starts talking to you about the power of being cured by the placebo effect, they are telling you an urban legend. Because the more accurate term is placebo effects, which refer to anything that happens to the participants of a study, like anything. Say, for example, you're studying a new allergy medication. So you divide your group in half and you give one half the new medication and the other half gets a placebo. And watch how they do for the next six months. During those six months, the seasons change and there's less pollen in the air. So people's symptoms get better. So the people who took the placebo got an effect but it's got nothing to do with the fake pill they took. It's just a changing environment, which is one of many confounding factors that makes studying real people in the real world so darn difficult. Also during those six months, some of those people might change their diets or switch laundry detergents or try a new air freshener or get a new pet. The list goes on. Even psychological factors, and there are some that cause placebo effects, don't always relate to the placebo. Just taking part in a medical study makes you pay more attention to your health. The routine checkups and surveys might prompt you to take better care of yourself, eat less junk food, work out more, or at least say that you are. Now, okay, what about the classic take a fake pill and think it makes you better? You know, what everybody thinks the placebo effect is. That can happen, it's called reporting bias, but it's possibly the least significant of all the confounding placebo effects. How much does it happen? Well, it's kind of hard to know because in order to measure it accurately, you'd have to set up a controlled experiment. But in order to control an experiment, you need, you know, a placebo. So we can't really measure it directly, but many researchers have concluded that if you account for every other confounding factor, then the psychological and physiological effects of the pill itself is little to none. But ironically, the least hyped of all the placebo effects is probably the most significant. 
something called regression to the mean, which is a sciencey way of saying getting back to normal. It happens all the time. You get a cold, and a few days later, you will feel better whether you took real medicine or fake medicine or nothing at all. Colds just get better on their own. For people with chronic conditions, it happens over and over again. They have some good days, they have some bad days, and those periods invariably regress to the mean. But the timing of all this leads to a bizarre kind of coincidence that makes placebo effects appear to be doing something when they're not. To illustrate, let's say that you're scared of being at the top of roller coasters. So your friend hands you a magic wand and says, wave this wand whenever you get scared and it will make you feel better. Okay, so the roller coaster gets to the top of the first hill, you get scared, wave the wand, and just like magic, the roller coaster starts going down. It goes up another hill, so you wave the wand again, and once again, you go back down. Another hill, wave the wand, goes back down. Amazing results! Now, you could analyze this data and find a strong statistical correlation here. I mean, it literally worked every time. And people who hype up the miracles of the placebo effect can point to data just like this to show that placebos really do correlate to recovery. But the obvious factor they missed is that people don't take medicine when they're already feeling good. They take it when they're here on the cycle, when they're about to regress to the mean anyway. So for you nerds out there who know fancy Latin stuff, it's called the post hoc ergo propter hoc, or for short, the post hoc fallacy. Just because one thing happened before another thing doesn't mean it caused the other thing. For a perfect example of the post hoc fallacy in action, I'm going to bring in Dr. Lissa Rankin to tell a story that she thought demonstrated the miraculous power of the placebo effect. Now I'm not trying to bash her here or say that she's a bad doctor, I don't think she is, but I do think she got a little too carried away here in her excitement about placebos and forgot to apply some basic critical thinking. So let's play a game. See if you can spot the one problem with her story and leave a comment before the end. The case study from 1957 of Mr. Wright who had advanced lymphosarcoma. So things weren't going well for Mr. Wright. Time was really running out. But Mr. Wright wasn't giving up hope. He had heard about this wonder drug called Krebiosin. And he was begging his doctor, come on, just give me some of that Krebiosin, until finally his doctor was like, okay, fine, I'll give you the Krebiosin. So he dosed him up on a Friday, not expecting that Mr. Wright would make it through the weekend. But to his utter shock, when Dr. West came in to do rounds on Monday, Mr. Wright was up walking around the wards. And his tumors, 10 days after getting the Krebiosin, they were gone. So Mr. Wright was up rocking and rolling, like praising Krebiosin as the miracle drug he believed it to be for two months until the initial reports came out about Krebiosin that said that it didn't really look like Krebiosin was working so well. And Mr. Wright fell into a deep depression and his cancer came back. So this time Dr. West decided to get sneaky and he, he told his patient that, you know, that Krebiosin that you got, that was a tainted version, really not so good. But I got us some ultra pure, highly concentrated Krebiosin. He then injected Mr. Wright with nothing but distilled water. And once again, the tumors disappeared. Mr. Wright was up rocking and rolling for another two months. And then the American Medical Association blew it by publishing a nationwide study that proved definitively Krebiosin was worthless. Two days later, Mr. Wright, after hearing this news, died. Okay, I fibbed a little when I said there was a problem. There are actually many problems. Let me know how many you found. And hey, here's another YouTuber who just made a response video to Dr. Liss's talk. Let's see how many fallacies he spotted. Two days later, Mr. Wright, after hearing this news, died. Wow, so that's so interesting. Uh, and it just shows you how important this uh, placebo effect is. You know, when, when the consensus says this Krebiosin is no good, if we hear that a lot of people are dying from this condition that we have, then we start to think, well, maybe I should die. I'm sorry. The correct answers were anecdotal evidence, cherry picking, post hoc fallacy, possible observer and reported biases, possible diagnostic error, and regression to the mean. Not, well, maybe I should die. What are you even talking about? Well, maybe I should die. Okay, so it's all about how we see ourselves. If we were to see ourselves as like the one person who had the right treatment, we would get better because we're playing that role. Oh, oh, that clears it up. Right, when people get sick and die, they're just playing a role. It's like, it's like LARPing yourself to death. What? We have to play the role that fits with the rest of the world. If we are 
like completely different and we're never getting sick and don't have to eat. I'm going to be ostracized from the group. They're going to think I'm a freak. They're going to think I'm weird. Oh, gee, why would anyone ever think that? All you said was that you never have to get sick or eat if you just decide not to play that role. That makes sense. Our metabolism is just a social construct. Right, like, unlike every other species in the animal kingdom, humans don't need food to survive. Really? Just remember that it's not, it's not just wishful thinking. This stuff is provable. Well, yes, it is provable. All you gotta do is just give up food completely, and that would prove it. Just, you know, go down to zero calories a day for the next year or so, and check back with me. Because your metabolism is just a story, dude. So. I'd really like to see how playing the role of a breatharian works out for you. These are the kinds of bizarre conclusions people reach when they take the myth of the placebo effect and run with it, sometimes right off a cliff. Honestly, I think we'd all be better off if that phrase had never been coined. The scientist who made it up was probably trying to be cute, but once something has a name, even if that thing is not a thing, we all start to think it's a thing because there's a name for that thing. So let's just call placebo effects what they actually are confounding factors. And to be clear, the vast majority of confounding factors have nothing to do with the placebo itself. If taking a sugar pill does anything at all, it might affect expectations, which could lead to bias. You might think you feel better, you might tell your doctor you feel better just to be polite, or your doctor might think you look better. But bias is not the same thing as healing, which is illustrated perfectly by a 2015 study of asthma patients. These patients were broken into four groups. The first group got albuterol, which is a real medication to treat asthma. The next two groups got placebos. One was a fake inhaler, the other was fake acupuncture. And the last group got nothing. After treatment, they were all asked if they felt better, and both placebo groups said yes. In fact, they felt almost as good as the first group with the albuterol. But how you think you feel is subjective. So the researchers took objective measurements of lung function, and guess what? The placebos hadn't actually done anything. The only group with real improvement was the one taking real medicine. So if you were wondering if placebos really cure diseases 30% of the time, the answer is definitely not. Which is why it's so silly to think that doctors could somehow trick their patients into getting better by withholding information. As doctors, we think we're being realistic, you know? We're giving people the kind of information we think they need to know. But we actually need to be more like Dr. West. Taking that distilled water, really, Mr. Wright, I promise, this is going to do it for you. But do we have to count on our doctors to dupe us? You know, do we have to get fake surgeries and fake drugs. It is a silly question based on a silly premise. But to be fair, she goes on to say that maybe duping us isn't the best approach. Good, because lying to your patients is a great way for doctors to lose their license. The American Medical Association's Code of Ethics states that a physician shall be honest in all professional interactions and report physicians engaging in fraud or deception. Hey, speaking of fraud, in my last video, we talked about homeopathic remedies, which consist of nothing but a sugar pill, if you're lucky and don't get the kind they accidentally laced with arsenic. They're, they're not very well regulated. But aside from the occasional oopsie arsenic, these pills consist of 100% sugar and 0% anything else. They are placebos fraudulently sold as medicine. But some people argue that they can't work from just the placebo effect alone because animals and babies. As a human, you might think that homeopathy maybe is just placebo effect, but when it comes to animals or babies, there is no placebo, and I see how well it works for my cat, and I just can't deny the effectiveness of homeopathic remedies. Well, if that's true and you really can't deny evidence, then I hope all the evidence I've presented today convinces you to stop feeding your cat sugar. It's really not good for them. And yes, Pets and babies absolutely can experience all of the placebo effects we've talked about. Regression to the mean and the coincidence of treating them when their symptoms are at their peak. Observer bias, environmental factors, random anything else. And yes, they can act and even feel differently as a response to all the attention they get when you give them that placebo. Finally, in conclusion, kids, stay in school and do drugs, not placebos. 
That was a tough video to make. Man, when you go and contradict doctors, you actually gotta research stuff. Look, look in the description. I actually looked stuff up for this video. I should just stick to contradicting nutty people on the internet. That's so much easier. All you gotta do is just let them run their mouths and- They're gonna think I'm a freak. They're gonna think I'm weird. You said it, not me.